Today I just ask that you would uh, enlighten us uh, according to your will and your ways. Lord, make our faith simple, direct, and powerful this morning. And help our footsteps to be uh, directed on one simple path. Amen. Don't you need simplicity sometimes? Life gets just too complicated, right? We're doing this, doing that. What about this? What about that? I'm a person that, even though I do, I am a little scattered. I jump from here to there. When I am in a place with God, I have to have simple steps. I need there to be one or two things that I do. And so I'm going to present to you a very simple message today. And I'm going to talk to you about the oldest person that ever lived in the Bible. And his name was Methuselah. Methuselah. And how old did he live? How long did he live? 996 years old. You're totally wrong. You are totally wrong. Methuselah is not the oldest person in the Bible. His dad was. Who's his dad? Enoch. How come we know that Enoch is actually the longest living person on planet Earth? He never died. died. Why do we in Sunday school always hear that Enoch, I mean, that Methuselah is the oldest person that ever lived? It's not even close to being true. Isn't it interesting? But he's the. He's the biggest number we've been given in the Bible. So we go, oh, 996 years old. Enoch has not died yet. He is still around. How does that make you feel? Now, this is where it gets exciting. This is where the Bible gets really fun. There's there's some awesome rabbit trails to go down. And sometimes it's okay to speculate, not not in a bad way, but to, to try to understand the bigger picture more than what we're just presented with. The Bible is a treasure trove of hidden mysteries. The Bible has, it, it leads so many directions and they are fun to follow. So this morning, honestly, I just need to have a little fun. I hope that's okay with you. When Enoch, was, when Enoch had lived 65 years, I'm going to cover every scripture verse and then one hidden one that has Enoch in it. And there's a couple of Enochs in the, in the book of Genesis. Uh, one is a son of Cain. This is not him. This is somebody that was seven generations away. Um, when Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah, not the oldest guy. After he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked faithfully with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enoch lived a total of 365 years. Enoch walked faithfully with God, and then he was no more because God took him away. Now, every other person in that chapter, it said they what? Died. Died. And Enoch, it said he was taken. There's one other person in Scripture that happened to. Who was that? Elijah. Elijah. Elijah was caught up in a chariot of fire. Now, okay, it says in the Bible that God has destined every person to die once, right? Every person is born or, born or bred, everybody dies. Unless Jesus comes back, everybody dies once, right? But there are two people in the Bible who have not died. What does it mean? Now, Enoch, there's not a lot on him, but there's a whole lot of speculation. In fact, there's another book called the book of Enoch that two different Christian groups believe is in fact inspired. I was actually reading it all day yesterday, or part of the day yesterday, just out of, out of interest and curiosity. It had some good stuff in it. Um, but uh, there's not a lot about Enoch. But the little pieces we have are beyond powerful, beyond meaningful. And they just literally are a, a window into a vast universe that some of us don't fully understand. That's all around us, but we miss all, we, just, we just missed the depth of this. It says that after Methuselah was born, Enoch walked with God. Now, that's not saying he wasn't walking with God before. It just means that it was re- referencing, I went back to the original language, it was just referencing um, the fact that from that point on, he had another 365 years that he was with people before he was taken. You know, in our cultures, we're all caught up in things like space alien abduction. And, and, and there have been people who said, oh, some space. Look, it says God took him. Amen. It says God took him. I do believe in abduction, but I believe in God's abduction. I think God abducted Elijah and I think God abducted Enoch. And he said, you boys are with me now. 
come here. You are not tasting death yet. What does it mean to faithfully walk with God? And there's the one sentence that seems oh so simple. We read it and we go, next. What's the rest of the story? Where's the battles? Who lived? Who died? Who did all the great work? The only thing it says about Enoch was he was a man who walked faithfully with God. Did you know that Enoch was one of the most blessed people in the entire Bible? There was no bad part to his story. There was no great evil he had to repent of. There was no great sin he had to run from. There was no army chasing him. There was no neighbor that hated him. There was, he was one of the most peaceful, blessed man on planet Earth. And nobody considers him a hero. Because our heroes are who? Generals and rock stars and people who do these great things, who have started off in poverty but became rich. People who have, you know, we have value. We place value on so many things that should not have the highest value in our, in our existence. What does it mean to faithfully walk with God? Well, it meant that Enoch was a husband and a father, and he just walked with God. And he walked in peace with his fellow man. And he was an example. Everyone went, there he goes. That's Enoch. He's walking with God. That's all he had. That's his only testimony. Is that enough? Is it enough? Because I don't think all of us understand that that's enough. Because as, as young people raised in our society, we, we think of greatness as defined by if you've killed your enemy or this bad guy came and you re- dealt out redemption, you know, re- retribution or, you, or you, were a, uh, you were a warlord. You somehow, with a bloody sword, overcame. You know, a person who has to do that, can God be with you in a battle? Of course. But is it what he wanted? Did he want you to do that? No. Sometimes you have to, but it's not what you have to do. It's not what God wanted. Enoch wasn't a king. He wasn't in charge of everything. He wasn't the central figure in a human-based pyramid scheme. He wasn't the, the, the president. He wasn't the guy on charge that everybody feared. He wasn't that at all. He wasn't a president. He wasn't a king. He wasn't a ruler. He had no human authority. Ooh, well, how can he be important if he doesn't have great spheres of influence? You know what we define greatness as today? And the evangelical church, which I am not, by the way, anymore. We define great leadership as people of great influence. How many people are you influencing? What is your sphere of influence? How many people look to you? May we all get out of the way and have everyone look to Jesus Christ. Amen. What a horrible, idolatrous thing that we have created in the American church. Oh my gosh. If anybody is looking to me as a Savior, please stop. I will, I, I will offend you on purpose. There is one who is in charge. Jesus Christ. I don't care who your pastor is. I don't care what church you go to. I don't care what denomination you have. I don't care about any of that stuff. What we care about is Jesus Christ. We care about Him being on the throne and we're just all the same beneath Him. Someone say amen to that. So Enoch was not a warlord. And Enoch was not a king. And you know, in this regard, he wasn't really a priest. Later on, he would become one. And I will tell you how that works. But he wasn't a priest. What does a priest do? A priest goes between God and man as a kind of an intercessor. And they're they're taking broken people and pointing them to God. A priest is the one who who speaks words of life and love and brings God's knowledge. And and, and that's that's their job is just to do this and pass them to God. Enoch wasn't even that. He wasn't a pastor. Oh, I know he had influence. I know people followed him. I know people looked at him. They said, wow, to be like him. I know all that was true, but that wasn't his job. He wasn't paid for that. Enoch wasn't a priest, so not a warlord, not a, not a fighter, not a king. 
He wasn't a priest. He wasn't the CEO of a Fortune 100 company. That was my dream for a while, and thank God I didn't have that happen. What a life. What a life. He wasn't a CEO. He hadn't collected great resources and to distribute a little bit through nonprofits to make himself feel good. Didn't do that. He uh, wasn't a billionaire. Oh, come on. He must have been wealthy. If he was God's man, then he was wealthy. I've heard people say that. Not true. He wasn't a billionaire. And he wasn't a rock star. He wasn't up on stage performing, having accolades and feeling good about himself because people love him and the roar of the crowd. I, I, I heard a millennial say, if I could just have, I would give my entire life up if I could just have five minutes on the stage. He wasn't that. He uh, was a husband and a father and he just walked with God. And he walked righteously. He just lived rightly. And he pleased God. Can I ask you, is it enough for you, gentlemen? What if you never get notified or noticed for anything you do? What if in 200 years, no even, nobody even knows your name because you're dust in the ground if Jesus doesn't come back, which we're all hoping, right, Shane? Um, what, if, what if your name isn't even on a gravestone somewhere? What if nobody even remembers your name? What if you never spend time on the stage? What if you never, cre never become a president or a king or a president or a company CEO? What if you never become that rock star? What if you never become anything that our society says is of the ultimate value? What if you just become a good husband and a father who walks with God with no regrets? Can I tell you, if you become that, you become greater than anything else in the Bible except for Enoch, any other human in the Bible. And Enoch was the greatest. Jesus referred to John the Baptist as greatest born among women. And he was talking about his generation. He was talking about that which was around him. Enoch and John the Baptist had the purpose and he was great because he brought and paved the way for Christ, right? John the Baptist was the greatest uh, but he was not even in the kingdom. Jesus said, those who are in the kingdom are greater than he. That's an interesting teaching. Maybe we'll do it sometime. Is it enough for you? Can I just ask you, in your heart of hearts, if you have a wake up with, Lord, have I lived my life correctly? I'm going to stand before you. Is this all there is? Do I, should I, do, have I got my significant portion? Have I accomplished? If you have those questions, I'm going to ask you, is it enough to be a righteous man? who walks before God, is it enough? If your answer is no, because I'm going to tell you there are days in my own soul that that's not enough. And it's not because there's not enough. It's because I'm misplaced in my thinking. If it's not enough for you, then you don't understand the window that that opens up into the miraculous universe that God has for you. Because it is the righteous men who live without regret, who just simply walk with God, who simply are good husbands and good fathers. It's those people that step into an un uh, unbelievable, amazing opportunity. Not to be rock stars, but to have great influence. Not because they want to be known as the person, but because God needs someone to influence society. That's why. Is it enough for you? Let me just have the Holy Spirit, let's all have the Holy Spirit convict us regarding our misplaced ideas of success or importance. Are all the men that went before me in the Mabe family complete failures because they were never rich? Or they weren't a pastor, or they didn't, weren't a missionary, or they, they didn't run a company, or they didn't... I did have one relative that... Never mind. <laughs> Or are they, are they of, not, of no worth before God? No, absolutely not. They had their place. I'm standing here today because of them. And my kids and my grandkids and my great-grandkids will stand in a place because of them and me. And you. What does it mean to walk faithfully with God? What a, 
What a one sentence mouthful, what a, what a door into an entire different universe than most of us truly understand. What does it mean to walk faithfully with God and have generations follow him? Look, he had Methuselah. Methuselah had. It just kept on going. There was faithful generations there. I talked to a man who could have been a railroad conductor who said to me, oh, you're a pastor. I will never go to church. I said, really? Why don't you tell me why? And he said, well, you don't understand. The reason I won't go to a church is because when I was younger, we were part of a very large Catholic family. We were poor like everyone else and we couldn't feed ourselves. And the priest came on, along and knocked on our door and said, we, you need to give money. You haven't given money. You haven't been in church in all these time. And we are building a new addition to our church building. And you, we've decided that you're going to give $500 this year. And he said, $500 when I was a kid was like a year's income. It was a lot of money. For my poor family, we couldn't feed. And that priest badgered and made my mom cry in front of the family. And I decided at that point when I was 12 years old, I would never, ever go to any church again. And I said, okay, I'm very sorry to hear that. That's a, that's a tragedy. Later, I had to talk with the same man, and he said, he said, well, you're a pastor, right? I said, yep. I said, you're welcome to come to our church. It might be a little bit of a drive for you, but you're welcome to come. We're not like that. He said, no, I'll never go to a church. He goes, but I got a question for you. I said, what's that? With tears in his eyes, he said, my grandson overdosed and died last week. His mother has been in jail. His cousin shot himself, my other grandchild. He said, my whole family's falling all apart. They're completely lost. They're broken. Why does God hate me? And I said, he doesn't hate you. Well, why is all this happening? And I wasn't brave enough to tell him the truth. Have you ever, like known the answer and you just didn't want to tell them because it would have just been a it just would have been a, a can of worms that you know and I'm not saying it was the right thing that I said or did I don't think I said the or did the right thing but I thought about it a long time afterwards this man who lived some distance from here and who could have been a railroad conductor uh, I used to ride the trains a lot in Boston when I was uh, working there and I thought well you know I was really, you know, I came up with all the answers afterwards when he wasn't in front of me, like some of us do. And I thought, well, let me tell you what happened to your whole family. Your whole family heard that story over and over again and what you imparted generationally to all, to all 11 of your kids. You had a lot of kids. To all 11 of your kids was churches are all about money and they demand things from poor people and we will never step foot. And I said, that's what you, I would say to him, that's what you passed on generationally. You let one man with one sin one time in your family own your entire family generationally. And that is what you passed. And so now, because he said, exact words, none of my kids or grandkids believe or follow God at all. Why does God hate me? Well, my answer is, is God doesn't hate you, but you hated him. You let a man with one mistake, one time, determine what happens generationally. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. How important is it for a man, a single man, to walk faithfully with God and just be a good husband and father that leads his family to church and not to the religious part of church, what if church is only a handful of people that meet in a cave somewhere? That's enough, right? What if church is two or three that are gathered anywhere? What if church is centered in the home? Which, by the way, this church is Hope Chapel. We're going to go back to being centered in the home. We're going to be every house a lighthouse, but that's later on. We're going to talk about this. I don't want our church to be centered in this building. I want our church to be centered at Mike and Ruth's house, at the Corbin's house, at the Mabe's house, at the Priggy's. I want it in Jen's apartment. I want it in Sharon's. I want it at... The church is going to be centered in our homes. But how important is it for a man to lead his family and keep them in fellowship where they can be reminded of the good things of God, where the Word of God will constrain and restrain and direct and point and advance righteousness generationally? How important is that? Very important. 
when I'm talking to an 87-year-old man who's crying because his entire family is the wrong way and he has no idea on how to fix it. Oh, by the way, I did tell him how to fix it. He hasn't done it and didn't want to do it. Repent. Get back to God. Call upon Jesus. Oh, I pray to the Lord all the time. In front of your family? Well, no. They'll think I'm a hypocrite because I don't do everything right. Okay, let me tell you how to lead your family. Admit your fault. Confess your sin. Say, say everybody, everybody, meet Grandpa at church. Since you live so far away from Hope Chapel, pick a different one. I don't care. Let's all go to church today. Do it for me. I'm, I'm 87 years old. Let's go. Oh, no, I'm not doing that. I, can't, I said I wouldn't go. Okay. Well, then you're not going to be the guy that fixes your family. You were the guy who broke it, but you're not going to be the guy that fixes it. Cold, hard truth. One event, one time, became a roadblock to a hundred-person family. How does righteousness spread through one man? How does, right, how, does, how does repair happen to the world through one man? My question is, gentlemen, are you going to be that one man that repairs everything, everything that follows you by simply walking with God and being righteous like Enoch? Can someone do one wrong that would cause you to pass on a curse to an entire generation not knowing? Well, it happens all the time. It happens all the time. But one man also brings his whole family to Christ. Which one are you going to do? There was a scriptural emphasis on Enoch that he was faithful. And you think that's not a big deal. Or you think, wow, that's okay. But... Understand the reason it said that Enoch walked faithfully with God and it was such a big deal is everyone else was not walking faithfully with God. He was the antithesis of what was actually happening. He was the light. They were the darkness. The reason that that was written, I want you to think about it, when it said Enoch before all the rest. And there were others who had interacted with God during that time. But Enoch was the only one that it said, and Enoch walked faithfully with God. The reason it said that was the rest were not. Think about that. The rest were not. Enoch was, honestly, he was by himself in that. He was all by himself in that kind of the depth of relationship. The other people weren't doing it. Not like Enoch. Do you know that Adam and Eve were still around at that point? Did you know that, that Seth was still around? Did you know that uh, Abel was and he was killed? But did you know that they were all those patriarchs were still alive? And Enoch rose above. Understand, Enoch rose above everyone who had gone before him. And he was walking with God faithfully. Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden. They could no longer walk with God. But Enoch, seven generations later, Enoch was walking with God. It didn't matter what happened to Adam and Eve. Enoch Walk with God. Does it matter what happens with the people ahead of us, behind us? No. Can you, can you walk with God? If, what if it's just you walking with God? What if it's just you? Can you do it? What if it's just you? Some of you that are sitting here, it is just you in your family. It's just you. Is that enough? Oh, yeah. That's the beginning. Enoch walked with God. What does that really look like? Well, I just alluded to something. It said that every day in the cool of the evening around 3 o'clock or so, we're guessing it's 3, but it's about then, God used to show up for a few weeks or a few months. Everything was going right in the garden with Adam and Eve. Everything worked right. And God would literally, God Himself, in some kind of physical form in some kind of, you know, I have no idea what that looked like. Was it a whirlwind? Was it a, you know, God in some form walked with Adam and Eve every day. Not just on the Sabbath. Not just the Sabbath. It's just about rest. That's all it is. Read the scripture. It's just about rest. He walked with 
Adam and Eve on the cool of the day, and he walked with them. Then later on, it says that when that stopped, seven generations later, Enoch came along, and God was walking with Enoch. I have one big challenge for all of you here today, and it's a challenge uh, for myself, but all of us. I would like you this week to go for a walk with God. And I want you to read this passage. I want you to think about it. And I want you to pick a trail before it gets too cold. My wife and I went out walking this morning and she was dressed like a, a polar bear and it was, she wasn't warm enough. Uh, it's going to get worse. So before it gets too cold, I want you to pick a comfortable time during the day when the sun is just right, when you're relaxed, and I want you to go for a walk with God. Just do that. Because it says Enoch walked with God and amazing things happened and he was so righteous. Can we just slow down? Can we just stop everything? And can we just take an hour, take one hour sometime this week and just walk with God, relax. Don't walk to lose weight. Don't walk to get from here to there. Don't look at your watch. Take your watch off, leave your phone, take your iPad, get rid of all that junk. Get rid of everything except Clothes to make yourself comfortable. Don't even carry water with you. Don't, don't, don't load up on all snacks in case you have to you know, venture into the wilderness and get lost. Just go for a walk with God for one hour and just see what happens. You know what's going to happen? I know what's going to happen. You're going to have a calmness to your spirit. Everything's going to slow down. Don't take anybody with you. Just you and God. And go for a walk. And then just listen, speak a little bit, but you have two ears and you have one mouth. What does that mean? We listen twice as much as we speak. Some of us pray wrong. Oh, Lord, oh God, and this happened, and this happened, and this happened, and this happened, and talk to me, Jesus. One, two, three. Okay, amen. Stop that. Golly, that is not how you pray. You pray by listening. Prayer is listening. Someone say amen to that. Two ears, one mouth. You listen twice as much as you speak. So you calm yourself down, you present your stuff to Him, you talk, you listen, you just listen. Then you look around at His nature and you see His beauty, and then all of a sudden you start getting filled with God's grandeur, and, and He begins speaking to you through principle and, and the wind blowing, and all of a sudden God, who is in His creation, is speaking and communing with you. And everything starts working out, and somehow you start walking with God. Some of you might even get addicted to it. Walk with God. By faith, Hebrews 11.5, revisiting this. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. The Bible says Enoch did not die. I had a pastor say, well, it just meant that Enoch went for a hike and they couldn't find his body or he swam and it, something took him. Or you know, I was like, no, 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 it's the whole word of God. You always go to the whole picture of God, the whole word. Book of Hebrews says Enoch did not experience death. He has not died. That dude is still alive. I believe the Bible is true. Anybody else? That means Enoch has not died. Now, here's the other thing. It says that everybody is appointed to die once. The only time that rule changes is at the end when Jesus shows up. That's the only time that changes. That's what the Bible says. It's appointed for every man to die once. That's also in the book of Hebrews. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life, so he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. Who do you think is pleasing God? The entire humanity said, oh, it's Enoch. (laughs) Enoch's the dude. He's the guy. That's him. I want you all to be, in any circle you travel, when somebody goes, Well, who here loves God? Him. It's her. It's her. Are you the first person that gets the finger pointed at you for that? That's what, you know, I don't want to be known as the Bible thumper. Who's the Bible thumper? Oh, that's Joe. No, I want to be that lover of God. Who here is the person who loves the Lord the most, who's just peaceful and and who just imparts and him, her, him. Boy, who's the real lover of their neighbor? Oh, it's her right there, her. What are you known for? Well, Enoch was known as the one. He was commended. He was the example. 
For before he was taken, he was commended as the one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he, whoever comes before God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. That is my favorite memorized scripture verse in the entire Bible. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For whoever comes to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. That was said about Enoch. That was the verse that follows Enoch. I never put the two and two together. The reason that Enoch walked with God is he had utter understanding that God exists, that he really exists. And the second thing he understood was that God always rewards anyone who earnestly seek him. That was the beginning of faith. Faith is understanding God exists and God rewards you who earnestly seek him. It's our faith that says, even though I fall, instead of running away from God, I run to him because he exists and he rewards When I stumble and fall, I get up and I run to Jesus. I don't run away. I don't I don't uh, I don't allow sin to come between us. When you stumble and fall, run to him, not away. Because Enoch understood you have to believe that God exists and that he rewards you. That's it. Just on those two statements means you will have no more problems in this lifetime if you get that down. You will have no more problems connecting with the Lord. If you know that every time you earnestly seek Him, He always rewards you. Do you believe that? Some of you go, well, no, because I did a really bad thing and I have to have penance. I've got to suffer here and I've got to spend some years over here and then I'm gonna, maybe I can earn my way. Maybe if I, maybe if I, maybe if I do this or do that or do it. Stop it. That's not faith. That's fear. That's religion. That's man's control. That's demonic oppression in your brain. That's all those things. No. Faith is God exists and He rewards me. Why does He do that? Because He loves you. Oh, you mean my heavenly Father exists and He loves me, therefore I run to Him not away. Therefore, any time I earnestly seek God, He always responds. You know why Enoch could walk with God every day? Because Enoch knew that if he got out and went for a walk with God, God would meet him where he's at. And so he just did. He just did. Don't overcomplicate it. Get rid of the, your, your stinking thinking. Get rid of the, the fickle feelings. God exists and he rewards. Someone say amen to that. Amen. Don't make things so complicated. God exists and he rewards you for earnestly seeking him. Every time. When you're hating yourself for your mistakes... You're, you're denying God's hand of redemption in your life. You're denying God's plan and His purpose. The devil loves just to twist you a little bit and turn that mirror on yourself. Well, look, you and I both know what we look at look like without Jesus. That's why we look to Jesus. It's fuel for your faith. God rewards. It fills you up with power. I come to church because I know God has a reward for me every single time. When Martha and I were having our, we had young children and it was so much work just to get out of the house. <laughs> First time, it took us three hours to get out of the house. First, the baby had to poop, then it had to eat, then it had to get changed. And oops, when he was eating, it pooped again. And now we got it on ourselves. We have to shower and change. Now we have to, I mean, it just went on and it was, wasn't it three hours? It was three hours. Yeah, we were a little late for church that day. (laughs) But I know that every time we show up, and finally the Lord told Martha one time, literally His voice spoke to her and said, every time you go, there's a blessing in it for you. Every time you go, there is a reward, big or small, there is a reward for you going to church with God's people, praying and singing. There's a reward for you. Can I tell you that what people don't understand about coming to church or being the church, because this building and our denomination and our our title, the, the name, that's not the church. We are the church. And every time you come together, there is a 
reward for you. There's a blessing. Even as God spoke that to Martha, understand that was proven in Scripture over and over again. God rewards. Every time you show up, there's something for you. Every time. Someone say amen to that. Amen. Tell your kids that. Pass that on generationally. Don't pass on, Joe made a mistake. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a whole lot more ammunition if you want that. I, I'll make a lot more. Now we get into some fun stuff real quick. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but ooh, this is good. Enoch, uh, Jude 1, verse 14. The book of Jude quotes Enoch. The seventh from Adam prophesied about them. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of His holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all of them all the, of all the ungodly acts they've committed in their ungodliness and of all the defiant words and godly sinners have spoken against them. Jude was a, a letter of correction written to multiple churches um, somewhere around the time, maybe 10 years before the book of Revelation was written. We're guessing, but the book of Jude has been accepted as, as authored by um, one of the apostles. And um, it says that Enoch, the son from Adam, was a prophet because he prophesied. Well, the book of Jude quotes this book called the book of Enoch, that the Ethiopian church and the Entrian Orthodox church believe is scripture. Today, if you go to their churches, if you understand Ethiopian, you're going to hear them read from that as part of their Bible. And the reason they do it is because the book of Enoch is quoted multiple times in the Bible. And so there's some, there's some, some scholars who differ, disagree of why it wasn't not included in the canon and maybe there wasn't any Ethiopian at that conference or maybe because it's a pseudo-historical book or because there's just a lot of reasons and we don't have to get into it. But the real interesting thing is, is that the Bible references the book of Enoch at least four times and possibly as many as 15 if you look at uh, what it was talking about. And... Um, there are other, I, I covered this as, as part of our, member, our foundations class or our, our reboot class, and that was that there are other sources quoted in the Scripture. Um, some of them uh, had some good stuff, but they weren't considered part of the Bible. Uh, this is one of them. The Bible says Enoch was a prophet. How could Enoch be a prophet? Well, I'll tell you why he was a prophet, because he walked with God. What does a prophet do? A prophet gets close to God, and a prophet then gives God's words. He's so tight with the Lord, he knows God's words. God trusts him, he speaks to him, he gives him a message, the prophet reveals the message. It said, it said Enoch prophesied. Wait a minute, the Holy Spirit had not yet fallen on, on mankind. Enoch blows all of our theology, by the way. We have, we have the Holy Spirit and we have God himself regulated in these little boxes that we, that we Westerners have tried to understand. It says that Enoch prophesied. That was before the Holy Spirit was poured out upon all flesh. Enoch was tight with God. And I guarantee you, Enoch was filled with his Holy Spirit. This is before the book of Acts. This is before Pentecost. Enoch was not a king or a priest, but he had the Holy Spirit. Old Testament, you know who had the Holy Spirit? Only kings and priests. That was it. And judges, which were kings and priests combo, right? So uh, Enoch wasn't any of those. <laughs> and he had the Holy Spirit. Someone say amen to that. And he was talking about at the end, and this is, and it, by the way, that prophecy was regarding specifically was regarding Israel's future. That's in, in the, the Middle East. It was, you can literally look at that as, as a magnifying glass on what will happen right there. A prophet is simply someone who's entrusted with God's message. And the book of Jude quotes the book of Enoch. Um, so here's Enoch as a husband and father who just walked righteously before God. And later on, there were other writings about him and there was other historical pass downs about him that they did not all make the canon of our scripture, but the apostles quoted him and referenced him in the Bible because he was so righteous. And they believed that that exact sentence came right out of his mouth and it was passed generationally orally over and over again until about the time of the Maccabees when somebody wrote down the book of Enoch. And this man who walked with God literally was a prophet 
and was the example. Now here's where it gets a little fun. It says, I think there's another verse that refers to Enoch and perhaps Elijah. And it's talking about something that's going to happen specifically in Jerusalem, not here, but it involves Enoch, and I believe it involves Elijah. And it says in the book of Revelation, I will appoint my two witnesses. This is a little bit of a read. I'm sorry this has taken so long. It's worth it, I promise. Revelation 11.3, I will appoint my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 for 1, days, clothed in sackcloth, they are the two olive trees and the two lampstands, and they stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes out from their mouths and devours their enemies. And this is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. This is talking about some great upheaval, cataclysmic times. It's not just apocryphal language, meaning poetry put around uh, human events. Um, the end of the world or the end of mankind's age that we're in now ends like this. And there are things that happen in Israel that may or may not involve us, but it involves Israel and it involves this place right here. And here are two witnesses that are put ahead. This is, this is literal. This part of the book of Revelation is literal. Okay. It says that they have power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. And they have power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. These are two very powerful men. Now when they have finished their testimony, the beast comes up from the abyss and will attack them and overpower and kill them. Their bodies will lie in the public square of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt where also their Lord was crucified. So where was Jesus crucified? Jerusalem. But it went in return to Sodom and Egypt, meaning Israel goes bad. Israel goes dark in the end times. Israel goes, listen to me, Israel goes completely dark. It's called, Jerusalem will be called Sodom and Egypt. Think about that. Let that uh, trip your triggers there. For three and a half days, some from every people, tribe, language, and nation will gaze upon their bodies and refuse them burial. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other gifts because these two prophets had tormented them who lived on the earth. But after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet and terror struck those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they went up on heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on. You're like, Joe, what the heck does that have to do with what you just preached on? Hear me on this. There's the window that you missed. Because I, I sincerely believe that's Enoch and Elijah. Now, if it's not, I can be wrong. I don't mind you saying, oh, Joe, you're wrong. It's okay. We, that's a gray area. We're not quite sure. I can be wrong. But Enoch, who walked with God, was used to help judge the nations and restore the reign of Christ on the earth. And the truth is, when you walk with God, you are used by the Lord in ways you cannot imagine. I had a friend of mine say, Joe, that we know that we, that's just not them. That's just not them. I said, okay, well, is it you? What do you mean, is it you? It says in the Bible that there are two witnesses. And these guys must be walking like Enoch. They must be really close to God. So is that you? And so my question to you this morning is, could that be you that's mentioned in the Bible, gentlemen? Oh, no. Oh, no. That can't be me. I mean, I mean, first of all, I don't want to die. <laughs> Second of all, I don't want to prophesy. I don't want God to have flame come out of my mouth and devour murderers and rapists and people who have harmed. The Bible says that Jesus has a, that one of the pictures of Jesus is the sword that comes out of his mouth. Right? Oh, that's not me. I can't be that. No, no, that's not me. Well, why can't it be you? Could you be one of those witnesses? 
Because I'm going to tell you, if you're walking righteously with God, anything is possible. And I'm not saying you want to do that. But I'm saying, can you be a righteous man that God uses? Could you be the person who stands on their own? Could you be a person that the whole world hated like these two men were? Could you be that person? Is your life the kind of, are you the kind of person, are you close enough to God that you would do anything He asks you to do? That you would go anywhere He sent you? That you would say anything He told you to say? What if God came to you and said, all right, Greg, all right, Norman, all right, John, I got this thing, someone has to do it, and I'm sorry. It involves a lot of rejection. It involves a lot of suffering. It involves tragedy. But I will raise you up afterwards. Oh, you're going to have to give your life. Probably, yeah, you're going to have to give your life. And oh, it's going to hurt. Oh, it's going to hurt. No, no, there's no angel pixie dust that makes all the pain go away as you're getting shot or stabbed or hung or or drugged through the street. No, it's going to hurt. But will you do it? Are you that kind of man? Well, I'm going to tell you something. If you are, if you are a man who walks with God, absolutely, 